As we start to understand this description of the Bible, we realize that the Bible is actually very unlike any other religious book in the world. And by the way, all people are religious. It's not just Christians who are religious. In fact, if you look in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, you'll find the definition of religion is this. Any set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. Does an atheist have a set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe? Yes. The atheist has a story about the world that he wants you to believe. Does a Marxist have a set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe? Yes. Marxists are religious. What about people who are involved in New Age religions? Yes, they're also religious. What about people who say, I don't believe anything at all? Do they have a set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe? Yes, they do. Their beliefs are that there is no cause, that nature is irrelevant, and there is no purpose in the universe. But that's a set of beliefs about the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. So you see, everybody has a story they believe to be true about why the world is the way it is. There's no neutral ground. In other words, like you leave Christianity and go to neutral some, somehow, and then you're safe from any kind of belief. To reject one belief is to automatically accept another. In fact, a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what faith is all about because they misunderstand what religion actually is. Some people will actually say, faith is believing in things you know can't possibly be true. But that's a spin on the definition of faith. I would, I would argue that what makes faith valid is not that we have it, but that the object of our belief is actually worthy of belief. And you can circle the word worthy in your notes there because you can actually discern whether or not a belief is worthy. We won't get into a lot of the evidence as we talk about the Christian worldview, but we'll get into a little bit. Does this make sense so far? Everybody has a story about the world, why things are the way they are. Everybody is religious, and every religious person has faith. The question is whether that, play, that faith is well-placed, whether the object of the faith is actually worthy of their faith. So let's take a look at Christianity from the standpoint of these criteria. What is Christianity's source of revelation? Well, we've already seen it a little bit. The source of revelation would be twofold. Number one, it would be in nature. Romans chapter 1 says, nature is such that people can look at it and see it is self-evident that there is a God. The second thing that reveals to us who God actually is, is the Bible, right? But you see, the Bible is one of those books that's everywhere but nowhere. I think the average American has 4.3 Bibles in their house. And yet, if you look at the statistics, you realize that most people have never apparently read the Bibles that are in their house. Barely one quarter of adults, 27%, are confident that Satan exists, even though this is a key teaching of the Bible and something that Jesus taught about. 47% of American Christians strongly agree or agree somewhat that the Book of Mormon, the Quran, and the Bible all express the same spiritual truths, which means only one thing. They can't have read any of the three of those books. 65% believe they are knowledgeable about the Bible, but 58% were unable to correctly identify the first five books of the Bible. 45% of adults in the United States strongly but erroneously believe that the Bible teaches that God helps those who help themselves. 60% of Americans can't name five of the Ten Commandments. Only 52% of young adults knew it was false to say that Sodom and Gomorrah were married. 50% of Americans, including Christians, can't name any of the four Gospels. So a lot of people have Bibles, but that doesn't mean they actually know what the Bible is all about. No wonder people mistakenly believe it's just a book of stories, fables, to help you better live your life. But what is the Bible actually? First of all, if we want to understand the Bible is revelation from God, we have to ac accurately understand what the Bible says about God. There are a lot of attributes to God listed in Scripture. We're not going to go into all of those, but we will at least give this one right here. The, the biblical word in the Old Testament for God is the Hebrew word Yahweh, and it means I am. That's the actual translation. So if your Bible says, I am said, and you're confused by that, not very many Bible translations do, but some do, then you can understand now, well, that's actually God's name. 
But it's not just a name as in like your name is Suzanne or your, your name is Thomas. It's, it's, a, it's, a compul- it's a name that describes who God actually is in his nature and character, right? To say that when God says, I am, is to say, I, in other words, he exists as a person. God is not merely a force, electricity, right? Light and sound. God exists as an actual, as a person. God has a personality, so to speak. That God is not a person in the same sense that human beings are a person, but human beings are modeled after God. We are made in his image and in his likeness. Also, you understand when God says, I am, that God is saying something about where and when he exists. He exists now. He has always existed. His existence never ceases. So just this simple little phrase, I am, tells us something about the Bible's revelation about God that is untrue of any other revelation about God anywhere in the world. And there are more aspects to this too. We can get into some of the others, but let's just take a brief look at this one. One thing it's, I found fascinating because it affected so much of Western culture about God being I am is that when God spoke to people, he actually expected them to understand what he meant, right? Genesis 1.26, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and so forth. In other words, God spoke to the people and expected they would understand. This is unique in religious traditions. In most cases, if there is, most religions that believe there is one God believe that he is utterly mysterious. You can't actually know him. In Islam, for example, you don't actually know anything about God. The only thing God reveals about himself is his law, right? He doesn't reveal himself, he just reveals his law. This idea that we can not only know God, but we can actually understand what he says is really strange to me. It's wonderful, but it's strange. Because to me, I can easily imagine God speaking in a way that would be incomprehensible. Do you know what I mean? Like God would speak to us, and it would be so grand and eloquent that we couldn't possibly understand a word. I can imagine this passage reading like this. And God said to them, It is to be considered an axiomatic imperative for you to consummate your consanguinity and proliferate through the diaspora acclimating your autonomous ego to the vicinity which you must tenaciously subjugate and exercise prepotency over the ichthyoids of the Oceanica and the columbiforms of the Caleman of the animated quadrupeds that diverse the terra firma. Are there any questions? Right? And all God's people said, uh-huh, yeah, what? I don't, what is he talking about? I don't understand. But that's not what God did. He spoke to people in a way they could grasp. Paul David Tripp in his book, War of Words, said, God reveals himself, his plan, and his purpose in words. Immediately after creating Adam and Eve, God spoke to them. It was his choice to reveal himself, to define his will, and to give identity to Adam and Eve by means of language. All of his other means of self-revelation were explained and defined by this one central means. It's important to understand how distinctive this really is in the course of all of creation. 